Hello, this is John Hesse, Cahoka Presbyterian Church. I'm reading from Of Moose and Men by Tori Martin and Doug Peterson. And the uh, chapter I'm reading is Ghost Fish. Something was definitely wrong with this bald eagle. Rob and I edged closer and closer to the massive bird, getting about 15 feet away, and yet it continued to just stand there, aware of our presence, but doing nothing. Each of us was armed with only a blanket, and we approached from different angles. Still, the eagle remained firmly grounded, cocking its head and giving us a good, hard look. Normally, a human being cannot get nearly this close to a bald eagle without it taking off and soaring away. It had to be sick. At least that's what the campers who spotted the eagle told us. So, being dutiful camp hosts at the Briggs Bridge Day Use Facility, northeast of Anchorage, Rob and I hiked about two miles down a trail into the wilderness, following the campers' directions, and found the poor eagle just where they said, along a narrow creek, branching off the appropriately named Eagle River. Rob was the brains of our operation, and he suggested we bring along blankets to throw over that eagle so we could carry it to Dr. James R. Scott, a renowned Anchorage veterinarian who founded the Bird Treatment and Learning Center in 1988. Dr. Scott had built up quite a reputation for rehabilitating injured and sick birds. We crept to within about seven feet of the eagle, but it still did not budge. Very strange. The blankets would protect us from the double threat of the eagle's talons and beak. Bald eagles have a hooked yellow beak, ideal for ripping into prey and unsuspecting camp hosts. Also, each foot is equipped with four sharp talons that can clamp down like a vise on its prey and camp host appendages. This bird was huge. It stood more than two foot tall and had a wingspan of close to eight feet. Rob may have been the brains of the outfit, but neither one of us had thought very far ahead. Even if we got the eagle in our blankets, how in the world were we going to transport it to Dr. Scott? Were we going to walk two miles back to our camper with an angry eagle on our arms? Oblivious to this part of the plan, we continued to inch forward. Now we were only a few feet away. Slowly, we started to raise our blankets. On Rob's signal, we would throw the blankets over the eagle in unison, and hopefully we wouldn't get a face full of angry eagle in the process. But as we moved a little bit closer, the eagle finally budged. It hopped away. That's all it did. The eagle didn't fly away. It didn't even try flapping its wings. It simply hopped away, as if it were perched on an invisible pogo stick. Rob and I exchanged looks. Shrugging, we slowly approached once again. The eagle hopped once again. This time, I noticed that two other eagles were positioned close by and watching everything unfold, probably the bird's buddies. I had a sne sneaking suspicion that the two eagle friends were snickering at us. In fact, I think the sick eagle might have been on the joke because every time we got within a few feet, the eagle hopped away as if he were taunting us. Finally, we had him backed up all the way to the creek. The whole scene was beginning to unfold like the climax of dozens of police shows where the officer slowly and carefully approaches the crazed killer who's waving a loaded gun. Take it easy, buddy, and no one will get hurt. I didn't actually say those words, but I might have if this had been a climax of one of those episodes. Again, Rob and I raised our blankets, ready to pounce. Then, at long last, the eagle did something no perpetrator on a crime show had ever done. He flapped his wings and flew to the other side of the creek. He didn't get much lift, just enough to get away from us annoying humans. I shot a look at the other two eagles, still perched nearby. They were definitely laughing at us. Something was fishy about the whole situation, and that's when we spotted it. Fish bones were scattered everywhere on the ground along the creek. It was like some kind of cult mass suicide, where dozens and dozens of fish drank the Kool-Aid together. Rob and I looked up toward the eagle, which was still standing on the other side of the creek. We realized this was not a sick eagle. This was a fat eagle. Judging by the bones, the eagle must have been gorging himself on salmon all morning until he was so bloated and stuffed that he couldn't get off the ground. Not until we had him cornered did he finally muster the strength to rise from the ground and wobble to safety. His belly, filled to the brim, with salmon. 
Most of us know the story of how salmon spawn, so I'll just review the basics. When salmon prepare to spawn, they swim upriver against the current, then they wiggle down a creek, returning to the same place where they were born. There, in a few inches of water, they lay their eggs, which are fertilized by the male, and then they die. That's right. They just keel over and die. But they don't expire all at once. If you spot a salmon that's just laid eggs, you might notice that it's half alive. You might see some little twitches, like some person in a Civil War reenactment going overboard with the death scene, twitching and flopping around for added drama. When they're twitching like that, half alive and half dead, people around here call them ghost fish. They're like the walking dead or the swimming dead, zombie fish. Our eagle friend had evidently stumbled across an entire all-you-can-eat buffet of tasty ghost fish twitching and flopping around in the shallow creek. Keep in mind that a typical king salmon can weigh 30 to 50 pounds. That's a lot of fish. This eagle ate and ate and ate, kind of like your Uncle Mari at Thanksgiving eating so much turkey he can't get up out of his recliner. By this time, the bird was doing all the eating, and he couldn't get off the ground until he became desperate. I know a lot of Christians like that. Some Christians take in a lot of spiritual food, massive amounts of Christian te teaching, which is a good thing. No problem there, but for some Christians, that's all they do, taking in information. They're comfortable sitting in the pew, absorbing lessons, spitting out the bones, but they don't put the teachings of Jesus into action. Christ told us to be fishers of men, but if we're not c careful, we can become lazy and overstuffed and too comfortable to go get out into the world and do any actual fishing. Upon reflection, I realized that before I came to Alaska and recommitted my life to the Lord, I was kind of like that ghost fish. I was only half alive. I had enough church experience to know how to go through the motions and do just enough twitching to show I might be spiritually alive. I was a zombie Christian putting on an act, but I was dead inside. My buddy Rob was different. He spoke the words and he meant them. He carried around his Bible, but it wasn't just a prop to look holy. He read his Bible continuously, and at first it bugged me. Rob didn't just devour teachings and loll around like an overstuffed eagle. He put the teachings of Jesus into motion. In fact, sometimes in his willingness to leap into action to help people put him in harm's way, as it happened in another incident along Eagle River about the same time. The McGuire's, a wonderful family of four, had been out canoeing when their boat capsized. It was summer in Alaska, but you have to understand that Eagle River is fed by a glacier, so the water is dangerously cold year-round. The mother, Sylvia, later told me that hitting the water took their breath away, and they came out of the water gasping as their lungs closed down. Knowing they had to find warmth soon, they ditched the canoe along the bank. Micah, the teen, lost his glasses in the water, and his younger sister, Shannon, lost her boots, so her father, Pat, had to carry them through the forest to the highway. Then they drove to the Briggs Bridge Day Use Facility and showed up at our camper, soaked to the bone and freezing cold. Can you get a hold of a ranger or someone to retrieve our canoe? Asked Pat. Rob didn't wait a beat. We don't need to bother the ranger. I've got a wetsuit. I can float down the river and get it for you. Rob's idea caught me off guard. It seemed like a good solution in theory, but the problem was that the wetsuit was designed for Florida. It was made to keep a person warm in water temperatures of 50 to 60 degrees, but the water at Eagle Creek was probably 35 to 38 degrees. It was almost freezing. Rob, don't you think that's a little dangerous, I asked. Stop freaking out. Yeah, but I don't. Before I could finish my sentence, he was already pulling on his wetsuit. Nothing I would say would deter Rob from an adventure, so I drove him 10 miles up river where he plunged into the frigid water. The water was a shock to his system, to say the least. A wetsuit works by allowing a thin layer of water between a person's body and the wetsuit. The body eventually warms up the thin insulating water of next water next to the skin, but initially it's freezing. In this kind of water, it takes your breath away. Even worse, whenever you move, the wetsuit pumps fresh water into the suit, fresh freezing water. So Rob alternated swimming and floating on his back as he was carried down the Eagle River. He knew he could stand about half an hour in the water before hypothermia set in. Personally, 
I thought he was taking his job as a floating camp house host a little too literally. I was terrified. Why in the world would he risk hypothermia for a canoe? It wasn't like it was made out of chocolate or something. And then there were the bears. This area was flush with all kinds of bears, including grizzlies. You were not even advised to walk alone in this area, let alone float alone down a river where you might encounter a couple of grizzlies in the water fishing for salmon. Wrapped in his wetsuit, Rob looked like a sausage, all snug and tight in his sausage casing. The perfect, the perfect grizzly hors d'oeuvre. It also occurred to Rob that he might not be able to spot the canoe along the bank as he went floating by, carried by a fast-moving current. He estimated the canoe was about a mile down the river, and he figured he would find it, hop in the canoe, and paddle the last nine miles. But if he missed the canoe, he could wind up floating the entire ten miles. Those were the kind of thoughts going through Rob's mind as he came around the bend, floating on his back, and spotted a couple of fishermen on the bank. Hello, he called out cheerily, waving to them. Have you seen a canoe anywhere along the bank? The fishermen must have been thunderstruck. Here they were, calmly fishing, and some crazy guy in a wetsuit comes zipping by, floating on his back and asking about a canoe. Have a nice day, Rob called out before disappearing around the next bend. Meanwhile, I was back at our campground, fretting and pulling out my hair. One hour went by, two hours. If Rob didn't show up, how in the world would we be able to find him? When I told the park ranger what Rob had done, he was initially pretty mad. But then he kind of perked up, probably thinking he might have a rescue on his hand. Maybe he was excited about the idea of finally seeing some action after spending so much time checking in campers and telling them where they could find the closest store to buy s'mores ingredients. Three hours went by, still no word from Rob. Had he been frozen to death? Had he become a frozen robsicle for a hungry, grumpy bear? Little did I know that Rob was having a grand old time. Even though the water was close to freezing, the air temperature was in the 70s. A beautiful sunny day. He spotted the canoe tucked in among some brush along the bank, so he climbed aboard and began paddling down the rest of the stretch to Briggs Bridge. However, maneuvering the wind the winding river was taking longer than he anticipated, and overheating now was his biggest problem. Paddling a canoe in a wetsuit with the air temperature in the 70s can get you heated up pretty quickly. I still don't think risking hypothermia to rescue a canoe was a smart thing to do, but Rob had an adventurous streak that bordered on recklessness, and he loved helping people. He was kind of like the Apostle Peter in that way. Peter had his issues, but he was a risk taker. Sure, he could be reckless and impulsive, but his holy spontaneity must have made Jesus smile. In Matthew 14, when Jesus approached the disciples' boat by walking on water, what did Peter do? He said to Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Jesus responded with one word, come. I wonder if Peter was shocked by that one word. Most of us would probably stammer, uh, I, I didn't really mean it, not literally. But Peter was game, and he climbed out of the boat with no wetsuit, no canoe, not even a pair of water wings. His faith was not half dead as mine was. He wasn't a ghost fish, nor was he a fat eagle, too comfortable to move, too complacent to care. Peter scrambled out of that comfortable boat and did a bit of strolling on the water. Before the wind scared him to death, and he began to sink. But give him credit. How many of us have walked on water? How many of us would have even considered jumping out of the boat? When Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples. In the account in John 21, the disciples were busy fishing when they spotted a man on the shore. And one of them exclaimed, It's the Lord! So what did Peter do? He dove into the water and swam for shore. Peter was so drawn to Jesus, he wasn't about to wait for the boat to reach shore to be with him. He hurled himself into the water. Are we drawn that powerfully to God? Would we jump into the Sea of Galilee just to get close to Jesus? Peter was a holy risk taker. And so is my buddy Rob. Peter was always leaping, jumping out of boats, leaping into action with his sword when the Lord was threatened in the Garden of Gethsemane. Although Jesus rebuked him for using his sword in the garden, I think the Lord loved Peter's boldness. No wonder Jesus called him the rock and built his church. Leaders take risks, and Peter had no trouble with taking risks. 
We don't need to take foolish risks, but we do need to get out and do something bold. If you simply feel too tired or apathetic to leap into action, know this. Isaiah 40, 29, 31 says that God gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Then those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. It's true. We can all soar if we just put down that 50-pound salmon and try. And thank you very much. Hope you have a good day. God bless you.